Thanks, Kyle. Appreciate it. Um, and, and really appreciate Kyle. Kyle's been with us for about a year, and you know what a wonderful job he does uh, for not only you, uh, uh, the media, but but for us, and so wanted to take this opportunity to thank him, you know, personally in front of you guys, and you know, appreciate him. Uh, a little different for some of you guys that have been here for uh, many years, and some of you have. Uh, uh, a little different. Normally, we do this the week uh, of the season. Uh, we we have some travel plans, some some long travel plans next week, uh, as you know, to Hawaii. So uh, the week uh, got a lot shorter for us, and we thought it would work better uh, to do this on uh, you know the Friday prior to. So a little different uh, with a week of inter or weekend of inter squad uh, games still slated, you know, in front of us, you know. But I always feel when we've done this uh, media day press conference, I've always felt, um, you know, it's kind of the unofficial start of the season. I know the first pitch will be on the February 16th, uh, but, you know, I know uh, getting all the reporters here and, you know, a lot more media coverage uh, going forward. I always, you know, think this is kind of the unofficial start. Appreciate you guys being here. Um, also, uh, I, and I don't want to fail to mention, so I, I wrote it down because there might be a question later, which is fine, but I, I didn't want to fail to mention, you know, the press release that went out, I believe, yesterday about the stadium expansion and how excited, you know, we are, you know, as a program, as a coaching staff, players, uh, I think I speak for everyone, you know, excited, uh, saw the renderings like you've been, you know, part of that process. Uh, along with our administration, and I know, I know Keith, uh, you know, is super excited about it. You know, and it's, uh, you know, it's it's been something that's uh, been in the process now for for a couple years, uh, but you know, super excited about it. As you've as you heard and read through the the. Uh, press release, you know, 450 uh, or so uh, premium seats, but several different options. Uh, uh, I think we're as excited as anybody to, to 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 add on to what is already, you know, one of the nicest stadiums in the country. Uh, I'm excited that it'll alleviate some of the, you know, um, uh, uh, ingress and uh, egress of the stadium here and, and give us a different, another, and a, not, I don't want to say different, but another entrance into the stadium street level, uh, which we haven't had, but uh, surely need. Uh, and with that, uh, the first Champions Plaza uh, with, uh, you know, the, 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 the statue and, 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 and uh, all the things uh, in that uh, happening, uh, being part of the uh, the championship and you know representing and, and being there for our fans to see and as I just talked to Kyle you know before I got on I think it's neat because it'll be outside the stadium it'll be something that our fans uh, can surely uh, appreciate and 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 see and take pictures on the way to the Grove and a football game and and other weekends when they're here in Oxford so um, and with that you know. Uh, I guess I also, you know, you know, think about when you talk about stadium expansion. Uh, uh, kudos to our marketing and you know Marcom team, you know, uh, selling another eight thousand uh, season tickets this year. Uh, first time in you know, uh, a few years that we haven't broke a season ticket record, uh, but it is you know to this point the second most uh, season tickets we've uh, sold, um, uh, second only to last year after winning a national championship. So super excited, and so more seats on the way. You know, for the the, the fans that want them and, and continue to show up. Um, one of the things that I've shared with a lot of people or comment I've made is, you know, what, what a difference a year makes, you know, uh, a year ago, I stood in front of you, you know, as the, you know, uh, as the leader of the defending national champions and, and, uh, a little different, you know, this year. And so what a difference a year makes, but, you know, a lot of reflecting, I think after last year, and as we sat as a staff and, uh, went over so many different aspects and areas of the program and where do we need to improve? What do we need to do to fix this, to get back to being the program, you know, uh, that we've always been here, you know, for 22 years. And, um, you know, uh, one of the things I start to think about is, you know, what a difference a year makes. And, and we've known that. I don't think uh, uh, it's uh, a surprise to us how razor thin 
uh, being good or not being so good in our league is. And that's what makes the SEC, you know, the number one baseball conference in the country that uh, from being good to not being so good, it, there's such a fine line to where, you know, an injury here or there, a, a tough year here or there, a uh, couple pitches don't go your way, a couple plays don't go, go your way. Uh, in our league, it, it not only, you know, sometimes costs you a conference championship, sometimes it costs you a chance to get to postseason. Um, but um, so with that, you know, I was thinking about, you know, how to introduce this team to you, you know, uh, how to present this uh, this year's 2024 Ole Miss uh, Rebel Baseball team to you. And I think two things come to mind. Um, number one, how much last year helped. And as painful as it was and as excruciating <laughs> uh, as it was at times, um, we thought and we hoped, you know, in the summer months, but leading into the fall, to watch uh, the players return to the field, uh, to watch their bodies change, to watch uh, their body language change, to watch uh, how much in, how much uh, improvement uh, uh, has gone, you know, to their skills and their abilities over the past summer and fall. Uh, how much you know last year will help these guys, and and sometimes that's really true in life. You know, when you what doesn't kill you usually makes you better, and uh, we've seen that in this program over the years, and and I certainly have seen that in in my team. You know, over the last you know five months or so, um, and the other thing uh, that I think you know, uh, was on my mind was how different this team looks you know 23 new faces uh that's a lot you know in a 40-man roster uh and uh kudos to carl lafferty our pitching coach and recruiting coordinator you know, along with mike clement um you know uh, carl's got an, another top 10 i think as highest ranked number six recruiting class in the country that you know just entered uh this past fall along with uh uh, a transfer portal class uh, ranked seventh in the country. And so uh, a lot of new faces, a lot of talented faces. Uh, and one of the neat things is when you look at this class, I think overall, and when you look at this team overall, um, as, as new as we, we just mentioned in 23 new faces, uh, almost even in each class, you know, 10 or 12 freshmen, 10 or 12 sophomore, 10 or 12, you know, juniors and you know, about 10 or so seniors. And so uh, even though uh, there's a lot of new faces, I don't think we, we feel and watch us play uh, and as you can imagine, with the transfer portal, uh, we don't feel particularly young. You know, we got we got guys, even new guys, that are either junior college transfers or have done it at this level in the Division One uh, uh, level and have had success. And so excited. And so with that, I'll I'll talk about the team and uh, why not talk about the most important position first, the pitching staff. So um, wasn't sure if I was going to do this or not. There's probably some gamesmanship in it. Do I really want to announce the rotation a week before you know the season but um, why not it's it's written and it's how it's going to happen so Friday night February 16th uh, JT Quinn will take the mound for us I don't think that's probably a surprise to any of you uh, but he's uh, one of the returning SEC starters from last year and certainly has had a tremendous fall and early spring and one of those guys that's not only earned it uh, through what he's done in practice, but I think um, gives us the best opportunity, the best chance to win on Friday night as we start the year. And from body language to attitude to toughness, and, and of course, you know, a, a tremendous you know uh, fastball and, and slider. Uh, pitching second, as you know, uh, we play a doubleheader on sun or Saturday, so two games, two seven inning games. That first game will be pitched by Gunnar Dennis. Gunnar Dennis is a left-handed junior college pitcher from. Meridian Community College, um, and not taking anything away from any of the pitchers, but from the first inner squad to last weekend, he's pitched better than anybody on the staff. He certainly earned you know this this role, and excited for him. Um, and again, uh, he'll pitch number two uh, next uh, next weekend. The guy that'll pitch the back half of that uh, doubleheader will be Grayson Saunier. 
Grayson's probably the the you know like JT uh, one of the guys I was talking about to where you know last year as painful as it was guys gained valuable experience and Grayson's one of those guys like JT's changed his body he's put on about 20 pounds since last year looks terrific had another great fall force uh, two inter squad games this this uh, early spring he hasn't given up an earned run and and uh, certainly excited for him to to start his sophomore. Uh, year and then another one that you know like Gunner may surprise some guys that haven't been out you know as much to watch us play but uh, pitching on Sunday will be Riley Maddox you know Riley Maddox is a guy that um, probably not until about mid fall or late fall did we start to think well maybe maybe he could be a weekend starter as you know Riley uh, you know uh, came back from uh, uh, an injury last year and pitched at the very end of the season but it was a lot to ask it was a lot to ask because of where we were in the season and uh, you know uh, from a win wins loss standpoint uh, and he kind of got thrown to the wolves but with that uh, we would hope we were hopeful and I told him this as tough as it was on him, and you could see that he wanted to help us, he wanted to bring some success, uh, that, that it would help him. You know, once he got to the fall, because he wouldn't be the guy coming off of Tommy John. He was a guy that already has pitched in SEC games, and uh, and now he uh, is you know looked upon as just another pitcher, and he has and pitched terrific this past fall, uh, again in this early spring, uh, and so he's you know made himself not just a uh, you know a right-handed you know lower three-quarter slot you know reliever, but a guy that can run out, pitch to left-handers as well. Uh, and run through some lineups and really kind of different from a lot of our, our pitchers can can really keep his pitch count low, can run through some innings and, and make it look easy. So uh, he will pitch on Sunday. I guess at this point I'd be remiss. Uh, I'm assuming all of you know, uh, but I would feel bad for not mentioning it, but uh, I'm assuming that you know that, you know, Xavier Rivas and Taylor Rabe, you know, got injured, you know, earlier, uh, you know, this past week, and neither one will, will pitch this year, uh, and so they'll be out for the season. Good news is, and you'll get a chance and opportunity to, to speak and talk to him, you know, here in a few minutes. But Josh Maltz is back, uh, finished his throwing protocol at the end of the, the fall, uh, got a good break and, you know, able to get his feet back under him and then started this spring just like all the rest of the pitchers. And has pitched well uh, the first two inter-squad games and, you know, super excited uh, to have him back along with, you know, Mason Nichols uh, in the bullpen. And I mentioned both of those guys because because both of those guys were, you know, as you know, integral parts of the 22 national championship team two years ago, and how well they pitched down the stretch and on the way, you know, to a, to a national championship. So to have both of those guys back two years later, you know, in your bullpen, I think says a lot. Uh, some other returners in the bullpen, uh, as you know, Mitch Morrell, Braden Jones, Mason Morris. Uh, and Sam Tukoyan, uh some other guys, you know, kind of fit into that category where they got opportunities to to pitch last year, um, and uh, and 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 some of them pitched really well. Some of them, some of them, their seasons were up and down. But again, I think that experience, especially in our league, pays so much uh, dividends, you know, forward that uh, uh, you can see that in fall practice and you can see it, you know, uh, early here in the spring. Uh, for the new guys, you know, some transfer. I uh, mentioned about the portal. Uh, some transfers that have come in have uh, done well. Kyler Carmack, Liam Doyle, Ky Connor Spencer, all uh, kids that pitched at the Division I level before. Uh, Kyler Carmack and, and Liam Doyle, I think, will have an opportunity to start at some point. Uh, they just haven't pitched as well as the guys that will be pitching the first weekend. So uh, I, we'll have to see how they do in the bullpen the first weekend and, and take it from there. But guys certainly that I think can do either role, uh, but guys that have been starters at the, the Division One level. Connor Spencer is a, is a short reliever. Uh, if you stick around today, you'll watch him pitch. You know, at the very end of the game, uh, had just an okay fall, but just he's been uh, terrific this early spring and just super dominant in his uh, three performances already. You know, this spring, uh, and also Ryan Rodriguez, another left-handed junior college transfer uh, from from Texas, along with those transfers, some some younger pitchers. You know, to look for Wes Mendez. You know, probably has pitched uh, better 
better than any freshman you know to this point and uh, has been you know dominant you saw him if he came to a fall scrimmages uh, this uh, this past fall uh, I think he was the high, highest ranked pitcher in the, the recruiting class that was ranked so high um, so I'm super excited about Wes Hudson Calhoun uh, Hudson uh, you know c comes to us uh, he's from Tupelo but went to a, a private school out of state uh, he's uh, uh, had a solid fall and, and has pitched really well this early spring and then probably the question that I'll get the most uh, is Austin Simmons so football player uh, quarterback backup quarterback that redshirted in football uh, he's uh, pitched a couple times for us in the inter squad games um, this is a uh, this is tough to pitch at this level and uh, especially tough to do it part time. Uh, so of course he missed the the entire fall. We weren't sure um, how that uh, was going to affect him this spring, but he's been out uh, with the guys for about three weeks now. Uh, as you can imagine, you know, just an outstanding athlete. Uh, but he's blessed with a terrific arm. Uh, he will throw the ball in the low to mid 90s with a uh, coach Lafferty's already you know kind of changed his breaking ball up and he's gone from a low 70s kind of you know high school curveball to a power curve at 80 miles an hour and even h harder than that uh, you know struggled in his first outing but dominated last you know last weekend uh, and excited about him and his opportunities as well now moving on to the other side of the ball as you probably didn't know, this is probably a little tougher to explain. You know, I think everybody's you know, so, uh, so anxious to hear about the starting rotation. Uh, I don't see Parrish Alford, so he didn't ask who the closer was. We haven't decided that, but I think we got plenty of guys in there. So, uh, but when we start to talk about the position players, um, it's a great. Uh, core some guys that had some some great falls for us, uh, but the reason I think it's a little different is because um, unlike some some years, I think you know we're going to have to play some games to figure out you know the the starting lineup and and where guys are going to end up defensively. So not just one through nine, but you know uh, what, does a guy play at second? Does he play at third? Does he play left field? Does he DH? And so we have some guys that are you know. Uh, I think are going to be huge parts of what we're doing, uh, and they may throughout the year move from position to position, like a Justin Bench or somebody like that. Uh, but I think uh, because some of them are trying out some new positions, the first you know few weeks you'll you'll see some guys move from infield to outfield, or from second to third, or from first to outfield, and those types of things. Probably more so than we ever have. So you know, starting you know with behind the plate, Campbell Smithwick, uh, right here from right here in Oxford. Mississippi uh, played his last two years of high school baseball here he played on the junior national team the USA national team uh, at a high school tremendous player I think he's the the highest ranked player in that recruiting class uh, should start on opening day he's kind of been dinged up with a um, a stress reaction, so not a fracture, a stress fracture, but a stress reaction in his foot and his toe. It's bothered him, so we've sat him out the last couple weeks. He's been hitting this week with no pain. Uh, he won't scrimmage in the inter squad games, but we do believe he will be ready for uh, Hawaii opening weekend, and we're just we're just want to you know try to prevent any further injury and, and get him back to 100 percent as quickly as possible. He'll be backed up by Eli Birch, who's a junior college transfer catcher. That if you've been watching us, he's been out there, uh, and then going around the infield. I think uh, Friday night, uh, Andrew Fisher will start at third base. One of those transfers we talked about from Duke University uh, had a tremendous freshman year. Uh, it's been terrific. You know, one of the things that people ask a lot uh, about, you know, when they ask about the portal, is you know how do the kids mesh in and how do they. Um, kind of uh, integrate themselves into the culture. And I think Andrew's a great example of, you know, uh, it's kind of, I feel good that it's our culture, but more importantly, I think it's the kids coming in, you know, to our culture that, uh, you know, integrate themselves, you know, and uh, just want to be part of the team. And uh, he's been a great leader for us uh, in just such a short stint on campus, but he'll start at third base on Friday night. But don't be surprised at some time that weekend, uh, some other guys get some opportunities at third base. Judd Utermark, you know, Judd uh, is a guy that's 
been injured a little bit here. He missed last fall, but then played last spring, but got injured again, re-injured his shoulder, had arm surgery again or shoulder surgery this past summer. Uh, he's back to full speed and a tremendous athlete. You know, one of those 6'5", 245 pound, might be the fastest guy on our team, really can play uh, any corner position on the field from third base to first base, left field, right field, probably could play center field. And so uh, just a tremendous athlete, uh, you know, so you may find him at third base, along with Ethan Leger, who started last year, returns for a senior year, could start at third base. Moving around the infield, um, uh, Luke Hill, Another transfer from uh, Arizona State. Luke's been terrific uh, in all aspects of the game. He's a, a very athletic shortstop that can hit, uh, which we're used to, right? You know, for, you know, we've we've had a great run of shortstops, uh, you know, here from you know Gonzo to Kessinger to uh, Servidio, Errol Robinson, uh, Zach Kozart, and the list goes on. And uh, and I think Hill will fit in right with those guys another sophomore that had a tremendous freshman year and excited that he's you know he's with us you know uh, backed up by um, uh, Braden Randall a true freshman from from Texas uh, Randall could start some games at short but also could start some games at second or, uh, or third base uh, uh, really uh, really good defender uh, and super excited that he's here our team captain uh, is Reagan Burford uh, and uh, could start on Friday night at second base uh, he's a guy that was on the national championship team he's been here for for four years and uh, um, he's one of those guys I think when you think about Ole Miss baseball in our office you think about guys like Reagan Burford you know uh, he's um, a great leader and uh, excited about you know him for his senior year year. Um, mentioned Leger, mentioned Randall. Uh, first base, uh, Jackson Ross. Jackson Ross is another transfer portal kid from FAU, different than some of the ones I've already mentioned because he's an older one. He's a fifth year kid. Um, Really tremendous hitter, guy that hit near 400 last year uh, with uh, over 20 home runs, and uh, certainly will uh, uh, add something to our lineup uh, somewhere in the middle of the lineup. Left field, John Kramer, uh, Leger, Utermark, even Ross. Any of those guys could start, uh, I think, uh, you know, opening day. And again, trying not to be. Uh, uh, so aloof with the lineup, it's just uh, you know not knowing who they're pitching and where where we're going from there. Uh, with four games, uh, I think all of those got a, a, an opportunity. But John, you know, returns, you know, uh, you know, uh, played a lot last year at the end of the year, and I think a, a, a solid left-handed bat uh, in center field. Ethan Groff. Uh, returns. He was a transfer portal kid last year, um, and and had a solid year for us last year, and and uh, a, a really good defender. Our leading stolen base uh, guy from last year. So uh, excited and happy to have some experience out in the outfield. And then in right field, Trayson Hughes. Trayson Hughes is the most. Uh, or the highest ranked, I think, portal kid that we have uh, will start in right field on opening day. Um, and so I haven't mentioned DH because I think I've mentioned enough position players uh, through that. So uh, with that, I'll open it up uh, to questions for you guys. Mike, in, in 2022, when we sat here, guys like Elko were saying, you know, go, getting to Omaha is, 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 is the goal last year with guys saying we want to make Omaha the expectation. Mm -hmm. I guess do you do you really set the expectations after last year? How do you how do you handle that? You know, sometimes you're the questions you're asking individually, and and I think it's you know uh, so it's kind of hard to you know. Um, answer the questions for the player. So I'll, I'll leave that for them to, to answer about their own expectations. But guys have sit in this, sat in this room and heard me say, you know, several times, I learned a long time ago from my former boss, you know, Skip Bertman, that high expectations beat low reality any day of the week. And, uh, and it's true. You know, and uh, uh, usually, you know, when you're good, you have high expectations. Usually when you've had success, you know, you've had high, high expectations. And so, um, and so um, 
again, I, I don't think uh, the expectations are any different this year. I know from, from myself, the coaching staff, and again, I don't necessarily want to speak for the players. I don't think that's my job, but um, you know, every year we expect to get to Omaha every year. Um, you know, at this point, we're, we're excited the season starts. The, the goals have been the same uh, since my first press conference. You know, uh, goal number one, to win 40 regular season games. Goal number two, to host or, or to, to win the Southeastern Conference Championship because I think if you're part of conference, that should be one of your goals. Uh, goal number three is to host a regional, not just to get to postseason, but to host and be one of the 16 teams that are you know, fortunate and honored to, to play at home. Uh, goal number four would be to host a super regional. Goal five would be to get to the College World Series, and the final goal would be to, to win a national championship. So I don't think our goals or you know, uh, expectations have, have ever really changed. It's just sometimes after you win a national championship, you have to answer guys like you a little differently. Mike, what have you kind of – you talked about a little bit, but Campbell, I mean, what has he brought kind of so far? What are your, I don't know, expectations for, for him this year? I, you know, I think he's going to fit, you know, uh, right in with a long line of great catchers that we've had here. And uh, uh, you've heard me say, you know, catching here is not easy. You know, um, you know, one, I was a catcher. You know, you know, Mike Clement was a catcher. Carl Lafferty was a catcher. Um, and so with that, you know, there's a lot of eyes that are watching you and are, you know, Helping you, but but are very critical of that position and what you know what that position means to the you know our team and you know our success and um, he's as talented as any freshman catcher we've ever had uh, walking in. Uh, he's a you know a, a tremendous offensive player and I don't think that surprises anybody uh, if you watch him hit in batting practice if you watch the fall. Uh, but he's a really athletic you know kid behind the plate and and uh, uh, you know. That part of his game is probably a little, uh, uh, probably uh, a, a part that's not talked about as much, and it, and it should be. Uh, but it's tough, you know. It's it's tough to play in this league, as we've said already several times. Uh, it's tough to do it as a freshman, and uh, but uh, he certainly fits in with the, you know, a lot of the great ones that we've had. Coach, um, can you speak more to Riley's journey and how what it says about him that he worked? so hard to get back on the field last year, even how the season is going and now um, his improvement in this season. No, just really proud of him. And and as you know, that uh, the, the, the Tommy John uh, rehab and throwing protocol, it's such a long, uh, drawn out, um, you know, time for those guys, and it starts out so slowly. Where they, you know, first they can't even barely move their arm, and and in each day it's so regimented of you know how much movement they can have, and then once they start to throw, it's so limited and it's so precise. Uh, it it is, you know, I don't like to use that word, but it is a grind. It is very grueling. I think physically, mentally for those guys, and then to come out on the other end, um, you know, it, it says a lot about them. Uh, but then you know to come out like I mentioned earlier to come out last year where he committed I'm going to do this put me on the roster as soon as I'm able to throw I'll throw um, you know and I told him I said I, I don't know what that looks like you know we were having those conversations about this time last year I said I don't know what that looks like I don't know what your role will be I don't know uh, are you willing to, to, to give up another year of eligibility where I don't know if you're just going to be a mop-up guy on a midweek game or you're going to be a, a huge part of our bullpen and he said coach I don't care what I am I, you know I, I want to be a part of this and then you fast forward three months and you see where we were in the season when he came and you know start was able to pitch uh, probably wasn't what either one of us expected at the time, uh, but he never faltered. He never blinked. He just grabbed the ball and continued to go out there. And it was tough, and, and it was a tough ask. Uh, but but he never made excuses and went out. And like I said, uh, I think it uh, says a lot about him. Then you look at him this this fall and what a leader. How much you know better he looks out there. How much more confident he he, he seems. And so uh, again, I'm proud of him and excited for him. Got more left-handers this year, Mike. Was that emphasis best available? Just I mean, kind of building the pitching. Uh, I don't want to say best available. Yeah, that's a sad way of saying it, Chase. Uh, I, the, the, um, I think there, there's probably a better way of saying it was yes. We, we, we you know, we need to not. We need to recruit more left-handed pitchers, and um, and let's be careful of how. Uh, um, um, 
how we filter that, you know, in the recruiting process. And so we've talked about it as a staff. Um, and then sometimes it's just the, you know, uh, the numbers and how it fa falls that particular year. And so, but this year, probably more so than ever, uh, or maybe it was, in fairness, probably a year or two, you know, because those kids are here now, um, that, that we sat back and said, hey, you know, uh, we've had some really good left-handers. I've had somebody come up to me and go, you guys are like left-handed you. And I'm like, really? <laughs> you need to tell the other 10,000 in the stands. You know, like, I don't think they think that. Um, but we've had some great left-handed guys, and I, I think that's kind of what one of the things we discussed, uh, you know, as a staff is, you know, uh, you know, be careful of you know the filter that we put them through because we've had some great ones, Rollison and Pomerantz and you know and others. Uh, but but you know make sure Nikhazy and but you know let's make sure that you know uh, we have enough you know and and that would help us you know and and I thought you know Carl did a terrific job and yeah there's 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 a lot more. So part of that I think is just by numbers and some of that is is by emphasis. You mentioned Tracy Hughes. Um, mm -hmm being a, such a high-profile guy. What, what stands out to you uh, about him and, and what made you want to go get him from the portal? Um, one, he can hit. I mean, you, you can just see it. You can watch it on video. You can look at it statistically. Um, but um, so that was it. We needed hitters. We, we, we've lost uh, just about, I, I guess it's true, every starter you know, over the last two years that started in Omaha position player-wise. Um, and uh, you know, last year we felt comfortable because we, we returned some of those guys, and now they're all you know basically gone. Uh, but uh, so that's one. Uh, but but two is since he's been on campus, uh, how athletic he is. You know, he's a, um, a, a center fielder that you know I think so it improves our defense that we return Groff, so it pushes him to to right field. Uh, and so I think our our defense, you know, when you put a guy in center that can really do it at our level and then you're able to put another center fielder in right field your defense in the outfield you know, gets a lot better uh, but then also to watch him over the course of a fall uh, he's just not a power guy he's a guy that can hit the ball to all fields he's a guy that handles the bat with two strikes um, um, and you know looking forward to him having a big year Wesman, this two-way player uh, listed on the roster. Mason Morris got some play appearances last year will we see the same out of Wesman there maybe more from Morris? yeah I, I don't I don't Right now, I don't think Wes will probably hit for us, uh, and then in the future, we'll probably have to revisit that. We've had that discussion at the end of the fall. Uh, we actually really think Wes can hit. You know, sometimes it doesn't work that way. You know, sometimes they come in and okay, we'll try it and see how how it goes. Uh, but I, I don't think there was a doubt that when we watched him pitch this fall, that we knew that he'd make an immediate impact on this team as a pitcher. Uh, and the fearful thing is, if we for the young kids, if we take too much time splitting time from the hitting and the pitching, uh, will that affect his pitching? You know, and uh, and so we we decided that with all these position players that we mentioned, you know. Your chances of getting, you know, more than a handful of bats are you know, not very good right now. So why don't we just focus on the pitching, and then we'll revisit it, and you know, the the end of the year, into the summer, and into the uh, you know fall of how much hitting you know goes. You know, Doug Nikhazy was very similar. You know, Doug we knew would make an impact. You know, uh, on the mound, uh, he had good fall. He swung. We we thought you know he had a chance. He certainly could be one of the top 15 hitters on the team and dress. You know, in SEC weekends. But then at some point it becomes risk reward where he became too good of a pitcher and not great of enough of a hitter to to, to do do both. You know, uh, there's guys like Head that you know, the risk reward. I, I don't know. I mean, is he a better hitter? Is he a better pitcher? You know, Jack Cacleone for for Florida. I mean, you you watch you know the impact that they can make. Uh, but when you're so good at one and not as great, not not good, but not as great at the other, sometimes you you have to make those decisions. And right now, we don't want to put the bat down forever, but probably put it down this spring. Mike uh, Willie Bloomquist, Arizona State's head coach, said after Blue Kill's departure uh, that. A lot of the players on the team think that they'd be better without him and the attitude that he showed at times. I didn't know if you were aware of those comments and if you had any thoughts on how Luke's kind of attitude and what he's brought to the team has been since he's been here. Um, wow, that's a strong question for a press conference. Uh, no, I'm not aware of those. Um, and that's unfortunate, you know, uh, that, that he would say that. But uh, uh, Luke's been terrific. 
and I, uh, I, I think if you interviewed any staff member or any guy on the team, he's been terrific, and he's played terrific. And uh, so he's a great kid, a great player, and you know, excited for, for a great year. Coach, you talk about the, how much difference a year makes, and you know, is there one difference between the 2022 and 2023 team that you and the coaching staff has made a priority to get back to either personnel or locker room one? Yeah, and I don't know if it's just the 22 and 23 team, but when you, you know, I think it combines with how many new faces. You know, we, we've talked about uh, one of the things we've we've always wore with a badge of honor is you know uh, you know our culture here, uh, the way uh, our kids handle their business, uh, leadership. You know, it's it's hard to look back at any of the successful teams, uh, and not just here at Ole Miss, but probably just about any sport. You know, people talk about you know the chemistry of your team. They talk about the leadership of your team and those types of things. And we thought this was a, a good year because we've lost so many guys uh, over the last two years uh, that we need to really focus and not necessarily do anything different, but to really focus on those things that you know we probably focused on a lot more you know 20 years ago uh, when we're building this thing and so uh, we've done that uh, and uh, but it's 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 not an easy or a hard sell I mean we've got a great group that you know uh, uh, a lot of them came here because of the culture and the leadership so um, it's it's been good kind of you guys are projected to finish towards the bottom mm-hmm. of the SEC West do you guys kind of just take that you and your players take that just as a challenge to the season or do you kind of just ignore that and just Go and get ready to play each and every weekend. You know, I, I, I always think that's for fans, uh, you know, um, that the coaches vote on that. So, um, but there are a lot of polls. I, I think, and I could be wrong, I, I don't think it's probably the first time in a long time we were not ranked uh, in any poll. Uh, I'll take your word for it. I didn't see that, but I guess we're picked, you know, towards the bottom. Um, but the truth, I've been in this long enough, it, uh, people are motivated by different things. I never really got motivated by polls, you know. So, you know, if you're if you're, you know, picked to finish first, is that great motive? You know, like I don't know how that works. I mean, we we want to have success. We talked about goals. I mean, I think, you know, every year we take the the same. Every team's different. Uh but so I don't really look at it that way. I think it's really more for fans, but that does not to cuz some of those polls you guys are a part of or vote or do whatever. Uh the truth of the matter is my opinion, it's really a lot of those polls in baseball, especially, are go from what you did last year, right? I mean, that's how it works, you know, in fairness. Maybe not as much with football because there's so much coverage and you know so much about their teams. But in baseball and probably other sports like us, that even though we, we, we do have great coverage, you know, more so than other, you know, teams, but baseball is different than football and basketball. And so to me, I don't try to get caught up in that. You know, um, it, it really doesn't mean a lot. The polls will change very quickly, uh, like the starting lineup and the rotation and Who's the first guy at the bullpen? It's a long season, you know, and at the end of the day, it, it's a month from now, nobody's going to really care where anybody was picked. So me personally, it uh, doesn't really do much for me. It doesn't move my motivational, you know, meter. For some of the other guys, it may, you know, and if it, if, if it demotivates them, you know, in a way that's going to, you know, positively get, you know, motivate them, then I'm all for it. But besides that, you know, it's kind of wasted energy for me. Mike, you've touched on a couple of arms that you've lost for the season. What, mm-hmm. How do you feel about the depth that you're going to kind of ask these? Those you know, I you know, anytime you lose, you know, somebody, especially like Xavier, you know, Taylor is a freshman, and we, we did see him, you know, pitching this year and being a part of this. But you know, anytime when you lose a, a, a weekend guy, I think that's that's a big blow, and so that's that, that's hard to replace. But injuries do happen. And you have to overcome them. And if you would have asked me a week ago or 10 days ago, um, and I don't think that changes now because of one guy, um, the, uh, the depth on this staff is much more than it was last year. And not just the depth, but the guys that have actually pitched in the heat of the battle. And so I think it kind of hurt us both you know, last year where uh, uh, we didn't have a ton of depth 
um, and a few guys and Josh and, and Hunter uh, that we had coming back, kind of the top two guys, when you lose them, now, you know, we liked a lot of our younger pitchers, but you know, again, they got thrusted into a, you know, probably a, a spot and roles that we, you know, that probably fairness to them was un, you know, not fair, and uh, and and ones that you know probably aren't you know the way you draw it up. So uh, I that was a long answer to I like the depth of the staff. I, I think we 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 a really good makings. Uh, we returned some guys that have pitched in the Southeastern Conference that started in the Southeastern Conference. Uh, that's a big deal, you know. And uh, you know, last year after Game One and Hunter got injured, we didn't return you know a weekend starter, and that's that's tough. That doesn't mean you can't have success, but that's tough. That's like starting a year where your quarterback hasn't you know played in this league or your point guard. You know those are things that uh, you need tremendous depth you know to to overcome. And last year we just weren't good enough to overcome that. I know it's premature, Mike, but how do you like the 16 team single elimination Cooper format when that gets changed? You know, um, it it was highly debated. You know, um, in you know uh, the meetings. You know, uh, I think. Um, me personally, I won't get into how everybody else felt, but I think it was probably pretty split. Uh, but me personally liked uh, the old format. Uh, but if we were going to go to one with all 16 teams, this is by far the best way to do it. And as as once you knew we were going to 16 teams and all teams were going to go, uh, I think we all felt a lot better that you know unanimously this is this is the best tournament. Uh, it makes the most sense where you get. Uh, uh, all all 16 te- if you're getting all 16 teams there you reward kind of like the basketball format you reward the teams that have done the best and so the uh, the top eight get a buy the top four get two buys and uh, that's fair and that's good it's part of that from the stigma that used to be of hey if you didn't make Hoover what if because I mean it's possible when these 16 get in you're talking the best 30 teams in the country out of them yeah um, that's always part of the discussion. Uh, part of the argument to that with, with the 12 teams is the most we've ever had is 11 or 10? 11? 11. And so um, if you've been here as long as I have and you've been in those meetings and the discussions of the tournament, we used to have eight. And then we got nine in. So we got a team that wasn't in our tournament. And so, but then you had a couple times where the ninth team got left out and really felt that it was a stigma place because they weren't in the conference tournament. And so we went to 10. And then once we got to 10 and we got, you know, 9 or 10 in the same thing, so we pushed it to 12. And so the argument against what you're saying is we haven't got 12 in, but the counter argument is, yeah, but we haven't had 16 teams or Texas and Oklahoma in, and do we want to wait too late? You know, uh, to where you know somebody's on the outside looking in, and so that I think, and I don't want to speak for other coaches or athletic directors, but I think that's what pushed to, hey, let's get all 16 teams in, give them all the uh, an opportunity. But once you get to 16 teams, it's really hard to do any type of double elimination, you know, uh, tournament. Just too many games and asking too much, putting too much on the players to to get through a week like that. So I think once we went to 16 teams, this was a no-brainer. Coach, I got a question, a clarification question about Hawaii. You mentioned two seven-inning games on Saturday. The Hawaii athletic site says a seven-inning first game and a nine-inning second game. And I was just curious. We're only playing 14, so. No, decent. I know I come to job, Mike. I'm I'm joking. I I'm not aware of that. That's a great question. Now I'll have to ask you. But we are playing, you know, two fourteen or two two sevens. We we had discussed that. We may have been at one point. We we discussed a nine and a seven or seven and a nine, uh, but it's some time ago. Uh, and I don't know when it was, but last fall we decided. You got any tourism built in for the trip? For the we players? do. What's kind of the plan? We do. Uh, you know, we're we're going a day early, um, just because the trip is just so long, um, and so uh, we're going to fly in. We'll get there Wednesday afternoon. Um, um, go to practice on uh, Wednesday night, but really just a light practice, really just to get them moving since they've been in a play, j- plane just about all day. Uh, uh, 
Thursday morning, uh, we're, we're going to take them on two different boats, uh, snorkeling uh, for, for a little bit that morning. Uh, and then uh, we'll practice that afternoon or evening. And then Friday, uh, we'll visit Pearl Harbor uh, for about an hour and a half or so in the morning uh, and do a tour, tour of that. Uh, and that's really the only two team type of functions because unlike a a lot of sports. We, we're playing four games, and there's just not a lot of time. You know, we uh, uh, figured uh, the sun and the water might be best. You know, you know, wake them up and get rid of some jet lag on Thursday morning, uh, and yet we don't play until Friday evening. So I think we'll recover from a little bit of sun on Thursday. Anything else? On Hawaii as a team, what kind of stand out to you about them? I have not even looked at it. I have not even looked at it. And, and as far as pitching, you know, you've got three season-ending injuries there. Is there a pattern you've noticed there? Or are they all just unlucky situations yeah. unique to their own? There's no patterns. It's, uh, as I think you know, uh, and I think most of the guys sitting there, it's, it's, uh, I don't want to make light of it. It's, 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 a, it's a tough thing. It's a really a, you feel for those kids that have worked so hard, um, you know, to, to you know, lose a year. But the great news is uh, you know, those those injuries are um, you know highly successful, and you got Josh Mallett's over here that's you know going to pitch this year. Riley Maddox, it's going to be a starting rotation that's that's gone through it. And so, with that being said, you know the 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 the, the horizon and that the path you know may be a little different, but but I think you know one where both those guys will be able to recover from. But uh, you look around the country, it's disappointing, but it, it the facts are the facts. It's just it happens, you know, too often, but it happens everywhere, and um, and so it's a shame. But you know, one that we uh, nobody has those answers yet. Thank you.